Hi everyone, welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with the Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Jerry Dehovic, for his monthly update. Thank you so much for being here. Always How my pleasure, are you? Liz. I'm excellent, thank you. <laughs> Beautiful day in RPV. It's like summer's upon us and uh, Things are going well within the city. So. I know. Well, now that the summer months are here, um, we always start off with public safety, number one concern of the council this, in a, of the city. Um, how are we doing? We're doing great, actually. It's, uh, as I always say, it's the number one goal of uh, every council member, of course, and I think most councils of all cities. But uh, things are going well. I think you know we were voted number seven, the number seven safest city in the entire state of California for cities of our size. So that was terrific. A um, couple quick statistics for you. I know you had asked about that. Crime is down, and actually it's the lowest it's been in the last five years uh, in what we call part one crimes, which are residential burglaries, uh, vehicle burglaries, and uh, grand theft auto, which Fabulous. you wouldn't think happens in RPV, but it does. But quick statistics for you. Uh, first quarter of 2018, we had 27 residential burglaries. That number dropped to 24. And, you know, I hate to even say that number because you really think 24 per quarter, that's about 100 per year, and that's 100 families that are affected. We'd like to get that number to zero. I just don't know if it's realistic or not, but we're doing everything we can to, to help the community with that. It just bothers me when I say that number. Anyway, um, burglaries from vehicles were 20 in 2018. We're down to 10, so we're 50% down there. And I think that has a lot to do with us publicizing, you know, lock your vehicle, don't leave your stuff laying around in your car, et cetera. And finally, in 18, we had uh, 11 Grand Theft Autos in RPV, and we had three. So we're on, the, we're on the right trend there, and it really has a lot to do with how our residents are vigilant and getting involved in our messaging, et cetera. So great job to uh, everyone on and, that. And also a big part of it, obviously, are the resources, the dollars that you're putting, because we've seen an increase in the budget just to have law enforcement out there and, and the numbers that they are and that kind of thing. Very large increase. This this council and the prior council took it very seriously. And we're spending millions of dollars additionally per year to uh, bring additional deputies on patrol and traffic deputies and, and SAT detectives that solve the crimes after the fact. So it's it's very we take it very seriously, but it's very expensive, as you point out. Right. Um, so summertime being around the corner one of the big deals of course we have to think about is fire season fire danger what are we doing to prepare for that because we know we are a hot spot here in Ranch Palos Verdes absolutely we are one of the largest cities with 90 percent and it's actually closer to 100 percent of the entire city in a high fire hazard zone uh, the city is very aggressively as you know we had so much rain and we have so much growth and I think we talked about it at our last show um, but there is so much growth that we have to aggressively and very proactively go and deal with what we call fuel modification, get the goats out, get the lawnmowers out, uh, assist residents. We've gotten a lot of calls from residents that are concerned with city property backing up to their homes, uh, you know, with, with 10 feet of mustard weed growing back there. So we're, we're going to jump on it. The staff is already on top of it. That'll probably become a year-round endeavor. Um, Are we going to get our own goats? I know we use fire grazers or we have we our own fire we have grazers. contractors. I mentioned that. <laughs> I think you did. Tongue in cheek at the last meeting. But yeah, we may have to get our own herd and maybe hire a shepherd. Yeah, there's a lot going on out there for that. Yeah. So anyway, that and also informing residents and educating them to take away uh, possible fuel immediately around your home. You know, uh, things that can burn, wood, fire, uh, uh, newspapers, anything that can catch fire, get it away from your house. So exactly. That's important. Furniture, things furniture, like that. Furniture, believe yes. it or not, goes up. Wicker furniture likes mm -hmm. to burn unbelievably. So. Um, since we're still talking a little bit about the summertime and how the city prepares for all the things that are going on, because we will see an increase in visitors to our parks and to our beaches, what are we doing just to be ready for that in terms of keeping our community safe and ready? Well, well you hit it right on the head, Liz. In the summer, we have the highest level of visitors and events throughout the city. Um, key part about that is planning and coordination, primarily on the part of staff. Uh, they do a great job. Public Works and Rec and Parks uh, works well in advance, and they, they deal with the, the city parks, the beaches, and the open space. And they're very well prepared, in my opinion, uh, for the summer crowds. And it's interesting. The numbers grow every year, so we'll see. Hopefully, they don't grow too much more because, as you know, we're, we're a destination city now, and everybody... I just hit so much traffic coming to, to do this shoot. I couldn't believe it. A know. sunny day in, in Rancho Palos Verdes. That's it right. brings the crowds. Um, in terms of emergency services and planning, there's definitely been much more of a coordinated effort with all the cities in on the peninsula. And there's going to be now in a new emergency committee with all, with all the cities participating. Absolutely. Explain what's going on with that. And I know the council... Um, 
took action to make help support that kind of a committee? Sure, that's going to be called the Peninsula Emergency Preparedness Committee, and um, that is at the forefront of the mind of everybody in RPV, and actually the other three sister cities on the hill. And uh, we we felt and we thought for many many years, and RPV has taken the lead role in this, and we will be the lead city in all this. Uh, we're going to coordinate amongst the the four cities: Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills Estates, and Palos Verdes Estates, and. Uh, really hopefully enhance the preparing, the preparation, the communicating um, uh, to effectively deal with the disaster because disasters are inevitable. Hopefully they never come, but you know, we're, we're in earthquake territory, we're in fire territory. Um, and we really are one peninsula. Um, you know, God forbid in the, the event of a major disaster, I think we're gonna kind of be an island unto ourselves. And I think that uh, it is imperative, and I think the councils and the other three cities understand that we need to work together to make sure we got this covered. Right. And we're prepared, and we can communicate, and we can secure this peninsula. Because in the past, there's been the regional law, Peninsula Regional Law Committee, which was Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills Estates, and RPV. But now That's this correct. is going to bring Palos Verdes Estates into the fold, so that is the extra piece. It will, and, they're, and they've, they've uh, embraced the idea before. They, they, you're right, they weren't part of regional law, but they are gonna participate in this particular endeavor. Um, and, and I think it's a great thing. And so who will be serving on that? Because I think at your council meeting, you're appointing members to that committee? Yeah, what, what we decided would that it'd be appropriate for the regional law committee as it stands constituted right now, which is uh, Councilwoman Brooks. She's been doing it for probably you know, mm -hmm. the entire time she's been on council and Councilman Alegria in preparation for uh, continuity going forward. He's participated on there, so we unanimously decided both of them should continue to do that and represent the city. Okay, well, so. we'll stay tuned to see what they're, they'll be doing a lot of important work. Um, because we're talking about committees, we'll move forward. May 21st, the council voted to appoint a liaison. So each right. council member will serve as a liaison to all the different committees that we have serving RPV right now. What what was the goal and hope doing that? I know you're, you're going to be now the liaison for the Civic Center Advisory Committee. Correct. And that, that kind of is what sparked it, Liz, and I brought the concept forward. We had a, a few issues uh, really dealing with lack of communication between the committee, um, the council most certainly, and staff to a certain extent. And, uh, and it caused some angst on the committee, and, and we had several people who wanted to step aside and did so, but we, we wanted to figure out how we could repair that and, and improve it going forward. And actually, it wasn't just a Civic Center committee. I got some feedback in our mayor's breakfast that we, ho that we hold regularly. And some of the, 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 well, obviously the chairs of the committees are there, and they imparted upon me that there seems to be sometimes a lack of communication or understanding between the council and what the committee is doing. So the idea is we will have a liaison, an individual, either one or two council members assigned to a committee. They can attend the meetings as they see fit and in coordination with the chairs. Uh, they won't participate as a committee member, but they will impart the, the under, their understanding of the council's uh, feelings and ideas, et cetera, and they will act as a conduit between staff, the committee, and the council. So that's important. The other big thing we did is we uh, uh, mandated biannual meetings of all committees, and I'll throw in the Planning Commission there also. So we want to get reports. We, we've been a, we were a little bit in the dark on the Civic Center Committee, and they were proceeding down one path, and we thought it was kind of going a little bit different, and uh, we just don't want that to happen again. Because in the past, the way it works with the different committees, because, for example, there's a traffic committee, there's emergency preparedness, preparedness. committee, you have finance, IMAC, finance infrastructure, advisory, all of these different center, things. And these are all planning commission. volunteers like you. Volunteers. And their idea is to kind of get together to help you, you, the council, do their work as well, right? Correct. So it's important, I think, for you to be able to be able to communicate directly with these these committees so they know exactly what they're trying to do for, to help the council, right? Exactly, yeah. and, and the way I look at it too is these are volunteer residents and, and it's one aspect, an elevated aspect on how we get resident feedback and input because these people are educated, they go to a lot of meetings, you know, we want everybody's input, but these are people that want to step forward and provide additional information. Right. And so. regarding the Civic Center Advisor Committee, which you said that sort of put this, how this all kind of got moving forward was, um, I mean, that's a huge charge. This committee is actually looking at what the feasibility is of building a Civic Center for a community that will be a mega, cost millions of dollars. That's right. And so, Multi yeah, you went to the, you now that you're their uh, liaison, how did that go? You did you, go sit on the meeting. I did sit in on the meeting and uh, it was excellent. I think it was very well received I think it was long overdue um, you know and I took personal responsibility uh, 
not only for myself but the council and staff that that we it was our fault that that thing was uh, running rudderless, if you will. That's probably a strong term, but but they felt we should have given them a lot more input along the way. Um, there are certain protocols and methodology, methodologies that should have been followed and they weren't just because of the lack of communication. Right. So. But it was a great meeting and very well received. And regarding the Civic Center f idea future, we'll talk about that in an entire show, not now. I was going to say, there's a lot <laughs> to discover whole, exactly, there. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that was a great idea that you put forward and I think it will be super beneficial. I hope so, and I think so. So we're going to move on to budget season. Mm -hmm. At the end of June, the council will uh, be voting on uh, and, and, um, the 2019-20 budget. Tell me how that's now shaping up, especially because I know council directed staff to come up with $2 million, right, in cu cuts and expenditures. You know, that's kind of funny. That's when a we, lot of money. When we originally talked, Liz, the, uh, the, the discussion was we'd like to see a million dollars in reduction. Oh, okay. And the city manager came to me and said, I want to bet you a very expensive dinner that I can get it above $2 million. And I said, you know, I'll take that bet and I'll be happy to pay it. I hope I lose that bet and he sure as heck did it and there are several reasons for that and I'll enumerate those in a second but uh, good news is is the budget for 1920 uh, is a structurally sound budget uh, we have a significant excess surplus in the general fund and that's after setting aside the 50% reserves that we have to for the general fund um, you know the the part of the way we save those dollars and I know that was something you alluded to earlier is We've, we've embraced technology and the staff at the city has embraced um, computer technology and different programming so they can actually cut down some of the work that's necessary on the part of staff while actually increasing services to the public and residents. So that's pretty exciting. And, and Doug Wilmore made some, some tough decisions about uh, not replacing certain vacancies mm -hmm. and, and uh, possibly asking people that are on the cusp of retiring to retire and that those all those numbers mean big dollars to the city in savings. So coming up with two million dollars in the savings but without impacting services and still improving that's uh, incredible that you could pull that off. It's huge and that was probably the primary uh, the primary ways we went about that and also there was a few one-time expenditures that that we were able to curtail going forward and, and again hats off to staff for doing that because council had absolutely nothing to do with it. Deborah Cullen the director of finance is awesome I'm in the finance business myself, and she is about as good as it gets. So. Right, and residents could just go onto our city website. I always say that every show we do, and just go onto the finance department. You can look at the budget, going on to rpvca.gov, and you can kind of see it all unfold and everything that's very RPV, transparent. Transparent, open, open gov, open.gov, and uh, they, they can look at every check. They can look at every contract. Mm -hmm. They can look at how much every individual is paid, cost of benefits, everything. And regarding so, some of the cuts though that were made, one of the big ways was that you're going to now be um, taking the sheriff's deputies that were patrolling in the preserve and replacing them with our own city rangers. Talk about that move, the sure. cost savings there, for example. Yeah, I, was, I had some angst uh, with respect to that initially because we did have the Mountain Ranger Corps before and they did a good job, but it was, it was lacking and they were, they were very expensive. Um, you know, we paid for travel time to and from Santa Monica, and they did a good job by and large, but they didn't have enforcement authority. Uh, the council had to take drastic action. This was a prior council, uh, and we decided to put sheriffs in the preserve to bring some sort of sense of authority there and enforcing the rules and the ability to make arrests because, you know, we had people smoking back there and staying well into the night and all this, and that's, that's pretty much dissipated. And the statistics on that kind of convinced me that um, with the cost savings and, and a whole host of other benefits, primarily the fact we're going to change the, the two sheriffs are not going to be redeployed onto the streets. We're going to have two more deputies now rolling around in RPV versus being in the preserve mm -hmm. proper. And we're also going to have, we're going to double the number of individuals on site in the preserve, which the, which the new, the new uh, rangers will be. They'll be city employees. Uh, we had five day a week coverage before. Now we're going to get seven day a week coverage, including yes. including the weekend. So all this, of course, goes back to us talking about the budget. Anything you want to add that residents should know? I mean, uh, you're you know, be, let me just peek watch here. Watch your June city council meetings to see what you do and how it all pans out. You know, but. the good news is I just again want to take my hat off to staff. We are a city that is financially sound in the envy of probably eighty or ninety percent of the cities in California, right. and and that's due to the hard efforts of staff and the uh, the. Uh, positive decisions made by council. And that, by the way, goes along with over my seven and a half year tenure, we've cut taxes to residents five times also. 
That's which is something we'll talk about in a second. I'll shake so, your hand for that yeah, one. There you go. My neighbor, <laughs> my mayor. Um, talking about finances, though, of course, one of the biggest sources of revenue for our city is Terranea Resort. Right. And Terranea is celebrating 10 years this it's June. unbelievable. I can't I believe it. I was at that ribbon cutting. It feels like yesterday. I know. Um, so what's it meant to have that luxury resort in RPB in terms of talk about the revenues it brought in so far over the period of 10 years? Yeah. Well, you know, I've first of all, numbers. first of all, Liz, I'm, I'm tickled to death just with Terranea in general. You know, that was the former Marine Land site. And uh, uh, it's, it is, to my knowledge, the only true luxury destination resort on the entire coast in L.A. County. And, uh, you know, you've been there many, many times. And what they contribute to the community is just, uh, uh, it's unreal. You know, you got the fine restaurants and all the amenities and, and the visitors there. And we've stayed there many times ourselves. And even local residents go there quite a bit. And it's like you're on vacation. It's a and staycation. It is. And really, <laughs> I live a mile away and my family loves to go down there. And it's really like you're somewhere else. It's kind of wild how that works. It's very special. Yeah, it's, it's a great place, great management, long, long serving management team, very responsive to the city. And when it comes to the financial side of it, it's uh, it uh, really helps us do our budgetary work. And what is the figure that they're saying over 10 years? I've heard $45 million yeah, in TOT transient occupancy It's right tax. around there. Let's let's call it 40 to $45 million. Um, and, and those are big dollars. Those are real dollars. And uh, it allows us to fund our capital improvement program. All the monies that come from TOT through council protocol and mandate were put to the capital improvement program. Uh, one thing we did do uh, as a council in order to offset the increases in the sheriff is we take the sheriff, the additional sheriff cost out before we fund the CIP. And we still have a very robust uh, CIP reserve, too. Yeah. So. so what do you think the future is holding for that resort? You know, the future is bright. Um, to my understanding and my knowledge, they are, they are consistently booked well in advance. Uh, they're pro forma numbers. They provide us numbers on a regular basis, and they they you know things look things look flat to better, not going down. You know they try and project almost five years out. It's tough to do, mm -hmm. uh, but the the future is bright. Um, things are stable, and obviously all the amenities that they have there, the golf, the the conferences that they have, all the local events, and. Uh, um, you know, really makes you feel like you're you're a world away from L.A., which we are. We're about as far as you can get. Right. You know? I know you mentioned earlier if your family goes there, do you have a favorite Terranea memory you might want to share before we move on to our next topic? You know, there there are several. <laughs> um, one of them was the gala we had, believe it or not, for our 40th anniversary, and uh, I was mayor pro tem at the time, and that was that was the largest party I've ever attended an RPV for an RPV. Uh, there were several hundred people there and dancing, and I get to say a few words, and it was really, really he nice. He was looking pretty jazzy that night, because wasn't it a jazz theme? It I was. <laughs> I wasn't as jazzy as some, but it was, it was, it was excellent and uh, lots of fun. The other thing that's probably more uh, memorable to me, because it was a, a three-day weekend. We rented a villa for my wife's 50th birthday, and we brought the family over, and we had uh, all kinds of guests and company and ate well and went to the pool and did that whole staycation thing, but it was it was special for her, so it made it special for everyone. You can just go there; you don't even have to spend a dollar. You can walk in the beautiful grounds. I mean, it doesn't even have to. Even the meeting rooms that we go in when we have meetings, both business and city business, at times you go in there and you know you're in a you're in a meeting room and there's a balcony open up to the you mm -hmm. know, Catalina and the Pacific Ocean exactly. and people lounging. It's really really has an excellent ambiance. So they do a great job. We're, by the way, we're called Terra Neighbors. Ah, there <laughs> that's you what go. we're called as neighbors from okay. Terra. There you go. Um, we're going to go continue on to some of the um, items that the city council has voted on. One of them being a, the annual EDCO increase okay. for our um, the rate increase for EDCO's residential right. solid waste and recycling services for the next fiscal year, 3.3 percent. So, you know, obviously that's just the annual increase. Why is it needed, and what's the impact to the pocketbook? Yeah, you're, you're correct, Liz. Um, the the increases are perfunctory. Uh, they are per contract, and they're they're non-negotiable. And these are not add-ons. This is a retro look back on the actual increases to EDCO, the cost to EDCO to uh, to deal with our waste here, and that's you know dumping fees, cost of fuel, labor costs. Uh, everything associated with doing dealing with our waste, and uh, so there there really isn't a whole lot to do other than to review and make sure and validate that the the costs that they incurred were in fact correct, and that's what our staff does along with our council subcommittee. Um, I think it equates to uh, you know off the top of my head, I think it's a it's a 
you know, single digit dollar number to the average bill to the average bill. And the, the, uh, um, there is a discount for seniors that'll continue and all that, but it's, it's a long-term contract with Edco. And as I said at the meeting, I have, I can't recall ever receiving one complaint about Edco and receiving a lot of compliments, including my own, because there are times where I see people overstuff their <laughs> trash cans and the guy gets out of the truck and takes the time to, to deal with it diligently. Right. We so. had the waste management before and I was fine with them, but this since Edgo has taken over, it's just been an incredible the service is unreal. Service is unreal and the management's very involved with the city. They're very generous, mm-hmm. philanthropic. They, they involve themselves with the community. Every every event they're there and on display and whatever we need as far as that goes, you know, the little chotskis and all that fun stuff. They do a great job. Mm-hmm. Great management team. And it's the same management team that's been in place since I've been on council. Right. So. We're going to continue to talk dollars here. Your council evaluated the way the city's business license tax is collected from home businesses and then businesses outside the city. So right. what's the latest action that you took as a council to impact the collection of the BLT? Right, <laughs> so right. not to be confused with a BLT. Yeah. <laughs> business license tax. We can talk about both. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was brought forward by Mayor Pro Tem Crookshank and... Um, what he thought was necessary that we clarify and modify the language in our municipal code regarding uh, uh, businesses operating outside the city uh, and actually because there was a little bit of ambiguity there and, and we worked through all that so we clarified that we also decided to remove um, the uh, requirement that home occupation home businesses pay an annual licensing tax and that was done primarily to encourage people to work from home um, you know, I think that they're probably working from home anyway. I'm not sure how much of an encouragement it is, but believe it or not, it could run into significant dollars. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, again, I think this is a reduction in tax. It is a reduction in tax. Uh, I think the the net dollar decrease is about 50000 per year, but it is the fifth time that these two councils I've been involved with have actually cut taxes for RPV residents. So All right. I don't think there's any city that can claim that. Excellent. Excellent work. Um, the council voted not to go forward at this time to put a charter city initiative on the ballot. That means to remain a general law city. Right. Um, explain the, to the community about that, like what that would, you know, why you <laughs> decided not to um, consider looking into the, you know, what are the pros and cons, I guess, of being a charter city? Yeah, there, there. That's a very complex question, Liz, and I'll try and keep it high level. I've got a full page of notes here, but basically, the bottom line is why a city would want to choose to become a charter city is to maintain local control. Uh, to deal with issues that are not are deemed a statewide that are not deemed a statewide concern, and that primarily has to do with land use and zoning, which, as you know, in RPV is paramount. We have all kinds of those issues. Uh, there has been an alarming trend uh, with the state and the legislature declaring matters dealing with housing, zoning, uh, things that were traditionally city issues. They're now deeming statewide concerns. Um, we think it that a charter initially was designed to deal with those challenges and take and, and legitimize the control that a city had with respect to those issues. Uh, but it appears that the state will continue to encroach on charter, the ability of charter cities to maintain that control. So that being said, we asked the city attorney to conduct an analysis uh, with respect to charter cities. And, and what you get is protection. Basically, you, you get legal protection if you were a charter city. And um, we went back and looked, at, unfortunately, and you might imagine, most of the time that winds up in litigation, right. cities against the state. And it looks like the uh, charter cities prevailed in only about 4% of the cases, and general law cities only prevailed in 2% of the cases. So it may not have the benefit. And also, isn't like about 25% of the cities in the state are, are yeah, charter cities? That always makes me think, well, why aren't more doing it 488 <laughs> cities in, yeah. the, in, the, in the state and about 120 is my recollection. Don't hold me to the exact number, yeah. but somewhere around there are charter cities. So, And there's not a lot of case law supporting some of the protections that we were looking for. And the other thing, too, Liz, is um, two big things. One of the pros that could have happened was uh, to date and as yet unchallenged via litigation is that most charter cities block the ability of the state to tap into our dollars, city dollars. and, and Like those TOT taxes. TOT and RPV would be a prime target because we sit on a lot of cash, cash reserves. We have a lot of money set mm-hmm. aside via policy and restricted funds, et cetera. But that, again, could be challenging in the future. And then the other thing, uh, there didn't really appear to be an appetite in the public for it. There are those that were advocates, and I think once we started talking, 
more about the, the you know, weighing the pros and cons and, and what actually you're getting for the endeavor. The cost of doing a charter, first of all, it has to be done by vote of the people. You have to have an election. You have to lobby. You have to, you know, uh, if, if we were in favor of it, you have to convince the electorate. And then the other, I guess I would consider it a con and some consider it a pro. If you ever need to change it, you have to go back to the people. So you better be you know, really crisp and really sharp on what your first charter is because you may not get the ability to change that. And that's, again, depending what side of the fence you're on, that's a pro or a con. Right. So, so this council then decided not to proceed that Council process. said, yeah, let's, let's, let's get a little more clarity. There's a lot of litigation out there with other cities uh, testing the waters. And, uh, um, you know, there was talk about getting it on this year's ballot, which would have been very difficult to do. But, you know, there's... there's you, more, more for future councils to deal with and delve into, and hopefully there'll be some clarity in the law, and it may or may not make sense. That'll become clear, hopefully. As mayor, um, the Memorial Day celebration at, was really a Memorial Day observance, I should say, at Green Hills That's Memorial Park. It, right. um, it was their 34th annual, and you, as a veteran, I appreciate that you were there. You got to represent the city. Talk about that moment for you and your message when you got up there before thousands of people um, on Memorial Day. You know, Liz, I, I was I was designated and had the honor of delivering the welcome. And uh, you know, it sounds like a simple task, but but you always try and deliver some sort of message. So I, I spent a lot of time, and I'm I'm fairly uh, retrospective. And and as I said in my 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 three and a half minute talk, there was uh, um, I would encourage everyone to go back and just Google Memorial Day quotes because there are hundreds of them out there, and it and it really makes you think and contemplate and. Uh, um, you know, it's it's a sobering thing, and you, when you really think about it, and I took the liberty of a almost tongue in cheek. I took George S. Patton, General Patton, and, and kind of modified one of his quotes and tried to give a message to the to the the residents and all the guests there today. But it was a spectacular event, spectacular day. Uh, the keynote speaker uh, was just just amazing, Scott Hewson. He was a major in the Marine Corps and went from enlisted to. Uh, uh, to an officer and was in, you know, 60 different theaters and 26 years of service and combat and the most recent wars. Just, just amazing. And, you know, I was in the Air Force. I never saw combat. And I, I, I'm in a different league than those guys are. I just sit there and, and in awe, really, of what danger our servicemen and women put themselves in. And then you really think about the million or so people that have died plus in, in service to this country. And, you know, freedom isn't free. You know, that's a cliche, but it really is true. And, again, I'm going to take the liberty of mentioning two of my friends, my dear friends, my roommate from college, Michael Norman Ayotte. Uh, he died at age 24, uh, flying A-10s on a training mission. And uh, another dear friend of ours, Randy Roby, he was a captain flying the U-2 spy plane uh, near Sacramento and, and actually had to bail out due to malfunction. And, Took it a lot longer than he should, and he's been credited with saving a lot of lives on the ground. So, those are those are two guys. Miss them, love them, and uh, you know, it, it still hurts. When yes, you think about it. I know. And and during the Memorial Day observances, they were saying those men and women that lose their lives like that, they're heroes. I agree, one hundred percent. I agree, and uh, most of them would would probably frown on you calling them right. heroes, but uh, yeah. It's, it's a special day, and I think everyone should really step back and, and reflect. And I would think special for you. This is your last term, and as mayor, you got to, to oversee this today. And yeah, it was very nice, and everyone was very, very welcome. Green Hills does a great job. Their staff, they've got that dialed in, and, and everything was spectacular. The parachutists, the music, the singers, it was it was excellent. I think it is one of the largest observances in the country. That's I my mean, understanding. And uh, it was very special. Right. Um, we are wrapping it up here. We're basically out of time. I just want to do one quick 30 seconds. Plug. Sure. We're talking about his quick celebration. Fourth of July is going to be around the corner. Big We're going to invite the RPD. city to that, right? Absolutely, yeah. You'll that's... be there eating pie and all that fun stuff. Oh, yeah. Maybe getting wrapped up with <laughs> people and a mummy thing. Who knows? But no, that's one of the larger events in the city. We have Whale of a Day and uh, the uh, July 4th celebration up at City Hall, the Civic Center complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a spectacular event. Again, neighbor getting to talk to neighbor. We're a big city, it has a small town feel. Uh, lots of stuff for the kids, rides, food, music, dancing, booths. You might even see some people running for council with booths up there. We'll all say. right. Well, it'll be a, a patriotic day and a day for Absolutely. community to come together. Thanks for what you're doing, all your service. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you in here next month. Awesome. Mayor Thank Jerry Dehovic, enjoy the day. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with RPV City Talk. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, everybody.